Where am I? Hello and welcome to this week's video. So since the last time I was shooting in this place, uh, I've actually redecorated again. So <laughs> I wasn't happy with the particular colour of grey that I had chosen. <laughs> so I've obviously had the Canon EOS M50 for about three weeks now. I'm going to talk about my own experience of the camera, which I think is just as valuable than talking about the all the spec and stuff like that. Obviously you know that I've been filming most of my vlogs either with this or the GoPro Hero 5, which have both served me incredibly well and I've been really really happy with the footage. I just felt like there was something lacking in the quality. This is an iPhone 8 and it shoots in 4K um, and 240 frames per second for slow-mo so I can't fault the slow-mo on this, it's phenomenal. The Canon EOS 3000. I adore this camera. This is always sitting on a shelf ready to go if I ever get a hold of some black and white film. It was pretty much one of a kind. This, these, when these were like kind of the first film cameras that looked like DSLRs, was like, I mean, look at it, it's beautiful. This camera is what sparked an interest in Canon. Canon has always been in the back of my mind whether I should switch completely to this system or whether I should just find the benefits of both systems and what each appeals to me. You've probably seen me in a few of my last videos. I know there was one in particular where I took out the 70-200. In fact, there's been quite a few where I've took out a 70-200 LCD lens, a 2.8 LCD lens, and that they're not mine. They were borrowed from a friend Jim. They let me borrow his Canon 5D and I took it out with his 2040-70, his 70-200 and his 2040-105 lenses. Very kind of them because <laughs> I mean, I do look after my stuff, but uh, it was just to give me a kind of flavour of what it would be like to shoot on a full frame system with those types of LCD lenses. I was completely blown away by how stunning the images are. So that's my sort of, my journey from film photography to digital photography to mirrorless photography. And I know this camera's been out for a year now. I think it's still retailing, I'll just check. It's still retailing at £600 in places like Argos and Jessops and stuff. It's been on the market for a year and people are still raving about it. This screen here is a huge plus because I can see everything on this screen. I can see exactly where I am in the frame. I can see how my lights are looking in the back, eh, the lights in the front. I don't need another person to set up the shot and to see how the light looks on their face and see how it's falling off and what the back lights are doing. I don't need in that anymore. It's literally a self-contained unit and it's fantastic. Obviously, you know, I was using the, the GoPro and the iPhone to vlog with before and so although they were good I'll switch between the iPhone footage and the camera footage. Uh, you can tell there's quite a bit of difference. I mean the quality is just better on that, the light's lovely on that, it's really come it's just the clarity is nice and um, this one looks a little bit muddy, um, blown up highlights on my face, on my hands, um, on the background, everything. So yeah it's, it's a massive massive step up. So let's switch back to this camera. 24 megapixel mirrorless camera. People might think that's a bit excessive for vlogging. I think it was initially brought out as a standalone mirrorless camera, an entry level mirrorless camera that you could use for photography and video as a side. But I think a lot of vloggers have seen the benefits and the potential of this camera and what it can actually do for vloggers. So personally, I have been watching a lot of YouTube videos to learn as much as I can about this camera. Um, obviously, I read the manual and then threw it away because I don't read manuals. I've been watching other YouTubers. And there's one guy in particular, a YouTuber called um, Potato Jet, I think he's called. I have learned so much from him about this camera. In fact, I actually watched one of his videos before I bought this camera. But what he done was, which I thought was fantastic, is he put a comparison up between the EOS R, the M50 and the ATD in the middle. It shows you the benefits of each one, he zoomed them in, he had them at different frame rates, it looked fantastic. And that really helped me basically work out the pros and cons of each one in my head. This one is an entry level budget camera but for 600 quid, like, you're still getting a pretty decent bit of kit. But one of my absolute favourite things about this camera and quite an exciting thing for me, a Viltrox adapter speed booster and stick it on that, which means that I can then get L-series lenses on that camera, so watch it, Jim. <laughs> I'm gonna be borrowing your lenses a lot more. Um, so I'm planning on getting that. It's like 50 quid off Amazon. I'm not sure, I, I think it just works as basically like a magnifying glass for your sensor. So it magnifies your sensor, which kind of tricks your camera into thinking, I mean, by no means does it make it a full frame camera, but it tricks your camera into thinking that it's a full frame camera. 
aye, so it's quite a clever wee thing. I'm going to buy one of them pretty soon and try it on it and see if I can get a hold of one of Jim's lenses. I haven't really had a chance to properly test it photography wise yet. I did do a time lapse uh, yesterday with it. Now that it's Aurora season, I'm going to try and get out and do some Aurora time lapses, which I think would be quite cool. So the first time I got to try the camera out was in the on the camper van road trip that I did. And um, I used it as my main vlogging camera for the whole trip and I absolutely loved it. It was so easy, so light. I had it on a sort of stick thing, just sort of holding it about. It didn't weigh anything. It was brilliant. It didn't come away with a sore arm. Usually what I would do is I'd have the GoPro on a three-way mount and um, just use that. It's still good. It's still 4K. It's not bad footage, but I just wanted a little bit more quality and depth of field. And the thing I noticed about the GoPro was that the highlights were very, very blown out and, and you had to sort of colour grade quite a lot in post to get it looking the way that I wanted it to look. With this one, I've noticed that initially when you move the camera up, so if you were doing one continuous shot um, it takes a minute before it changes its exposure so if I'm doing like one continuous shot like that and I point up at the trees in here we find really well exposed until I get to the sky or I get to the top of a landscape um, and I'm pointing at mountains whatever it is and I noticed at that point that it was blown out for a split second and then it changes and then it sort of changes its exposure and catches up it's very noticeable I think you'd have to do like a, a jump cut to hide it if you if you did sort of shoot like that I think most people would probably just have it pointing at the subject, dial in the exposure and then just pan. The quality straight off the back was fantastic. I did notice in low light, it's supposed to be fantastic in low light and I noticed that when I had it in Anstruther, you'll notice the footage when I was there, I had the car lights shining on my face. I was using the M50 to sort of vlog the lighthouse behind me. It was quite grainy. It wasn't as smooth as I would have expected considering a lot of people sort of say, oh, it's great for gigs and great for sort of shooting like music videos and things like that. Like I've seen loads of people online shooting loads of stuff with this. I've seen somebody using it for a hockey match. They did have a Sigma art lens on it. So I think that might make a difference. And um, so that was the first thing I noticed when I started vlogging, but it was very, very close to my face and uh, I don't like things that close to my face. <laughs> so I had to sort of consciously either mount it on something just so I could get a bit further back. That's one other thing I think I spoke about in my last video was the image stabilization. It's actually built into the lens, so still fairly bumpy it's not it's not as bad as walking with your phone and, and filming that that would be pretty bumpy it's not as bad as that but it's not gopro karma grip like buttery smooth so i think for that reason that has pretty much convinced me to buy a rodent <laughs> i was going to buy one anyway i want to try and get into more sort of cinematic filming so run out of memory I'm going to buy it bigger than a 64 gig card because apparently I talk far too much. There seems to be a trend I've noticed in um, landscape photographers YouTube videos and it's they've got the sort of cool drone footage and everything looks very beautiful and cinematic and I absolutely love that. And obviously I have got drone footage in my, in my videos but I'd like to sort of up my game so to speak. The things I love about this camera is how compact it is, how lightweight it is. I can take this thing up a mountain if I wanted to and I would get some pretty beautiful uh, filming done with it. The only thing I was considering was getting the Ronin, which would make it even more stable. But as I was talking to Chris from Scottish Mountain Goat uh, on YouTube, um, we were talking about the Ronin and talking about hill walking. We both love hill walking and um, we were talking about it online and um, discussing the weight of it. So the Ronin SE is 1.1 kilograms or an extra kilogram of weight when you're hill walking would definitely make or break you. If you've got any suggestions for anything I can stick the M50 into that will make it a bit more lightweight but give it a bit of stabilisation, then certainly let me know in the comments. Well, yeah, the other thing I like about this camera is it has its own type of raw file, which is called compressed raw, so it's called C-RAW files, which um, are still a full raw file, but for some reason uh, they don't take up as much space, which is great. So I can save far more footage and I can save far more pictures if I was taking pictures. Um, on my hard drives and stuff like that without taking up too much space. I have four hard drives, so I have two of those orangey sort of rugged ones, a black one. I also have a PC tower with three hard drives in it. So I've got a lot of stuff being backed up all the time. I've got iCloud storage as well. I've got Google photo storage as well. The compressed raw files is a major plus for me because I can store hundreds and hundreds of data without taking up too much space. The one thing that took me a little bit by surprise, which I'm not really sure if it's a pro or a con, was the viewfinder. So there's an electric viewfinder. You can either switch between that or the screen. I've never been a, a live view type screen shooting person. Right, so here's me filming with my iPhone. And as you can see on that this is just in record mode but there's a lot of icons around about there uh, and it's it's a little bit messy 
And I know there's probably a way you can switch all them off, but I haven't quite figured it out yet. So, so the only thing about the screen, um, I do like the screen because also because I've used the Canon system before, I do know my way around the Canon menu. I've so, also, it comes with two menus, Bobby basic menu, and you've got a more sort of in-depth menu that looks like the menu that you get on all other Canon cameras. Obviously that's because this is an entry-level mirrorless camera and I can understand why they've done that. If you're just starting out photography it's brilliant because it's a very simplified version and I would imagine if you opened this camera up and it only had the sort of standard Canon uh, format in the back it would be terrifying to look at that. So it is good that they've done that and they've put a sort of simplified version of their menu system up which is quite cool. As I'm speaking the battery life is flashing at my face. So I've had to buy two extra batteries for this camera and a sort of dual charger for it to get them very quickly charged. Canon batteries in it just now, the other two are aftermarket, I'll tell you what they are, hang on. This is the Canon battery that I've just taken out of this camera and I have been shooting 30 minutes or so on this charge, which is not great to be honest. So I had to buy two others, Power Extra Replacement LP E12 battery and I actually find that this one lasts twice as long as this one, which is not great, but I did notice that in the reviews that the battery life wasn't the best. So for that reason, I straight up bought two batteries in another pack so that I could um, sort of combat that if I was out and about and I'd have, always have two fully charged batteries in my bag. So that should theoretically give me another hour and a half's worth of footage off the back of these ones because they do last about 15 minutes, 20 minutes longer than this one does if I'm shooting continuous video, which I'm doing just now. So definitely would recommend buying hundreds of batteries for it. <laughs> and you can get these on Amazon for like 15 quid I think, but well worth it. What you're paying for, you're still paying for a really fantastic mirrorless camera. Pro number one, the fact that this camera has a touch screen on it, it's a very natural progression to just start poking about the buttons on the touch screen, but I'm gonna to have to figure out if I can use some of those customizable buttons, which brings me on to pro number two. Customizable buttons on this camera is a fantastic feature. I love this so much. I like to have things very particularly in a sort of certain order and how things are and how things are laid out. Um, and this is just perfect for me because I can basically go in there to my heart's content and put things wherever I want and it's just brilliant. Pro number three is the fact that there's a, a mic jack. I can attach my road mic up to the top of it. Pro number four is the fact that I can buy an adapter and put LCD lenses on it. I've spoken about that in great detail so I'm not going to go into it any further. Pro number five is the fact that we can shoot time lapses, we can shoot slow-mo. One thing I would like is I know I can shoot 240 frames per second on this and I can only shoot 100 frames per second on this for slow-mo. I'd like to see that increased at some point in some of the future models. Pro number six, uh, pro number six is the fact that it can live stream. Pro number seven is the fact that I can be tethered. Pro number eight, uh, sorry, is it a fact I can be tethered wirelessly. Pro number eight is the fact that I can transfer everything off this camera as soon as this video is done straight to my iPad to start editing. So that's amazing. The cons for this camera. Sometimes in low light situations, the footage can look quite digital looking. It has that sort of digital quality about it, but it looks a bit pixelated and a bit weird and a bit uh. Con number two is obviously the battery life. The battery life is utterly rotten. I mean, it's, it's bad, it's really bad. It's manageable if you're happy to spend 20 quid on a couple aftermarket batteries, it's totally fine and it's not that much of an issue to be honest. Uh, con number three is the fact that it only shoots slow-mo in 720p. Slow-mo is a big, big part of cinematic shooting from what I've gathered on YouTube. <laughs> I think ultimately though what they're doing is they're giving you enough good features on this camera to bring you into the market and to show you what what you can do if you want to become a vlogger and shoot things on YouTube. It's not a perfect camera, every camera has its faults, Sony's have their faults, um, the Nikon's have their faults, they'll have pros and cons. I think what it's about is finding the camera that suits you and what your needs are and what you need to do with the camera and what the tools you need from that camera are. So for me it's perfect for vlogging. Going by the footage in here it's perfect for indoor vlogging. I remember reading some of the camera reviews online, cameras on the market that are very very similar. You just need to find the one that suits you I think. On that note I'm going to go and try and shoot some slow-mo footage to see what it looks like on this camera. As of next week, we'll be back out on location. The weather here has been so temperamental, you can't even judge it. Obviously, the last video, I think I was walking through the moss and it was the most stunning mornings, hundreds of mist everywhere, it was absolutely gorgeous. The morning after that was really cloudy and rubbish, so yes, but 
autumn is officially here. It's uh, I've noticed most of the leaves are now turning. I'm going to head back up to the Trossachs at some point and have a look at Loch Acre. Quite excited to see the Dukes Pass at this time of year. I think it's going to be gorgeous. I'm hoping to try and get to places like Kelly Cranky. There's a bridge there that just overlooks this split in the forest and hopefully they should be golden and red and gorgeous. So I've got loads and loads of stuff coming up. Uh, November, I'm heading down to the Lake District. So I'm really looking forward to that as well. But yeah, I hope you've enjoyed my experiences of the Canon EOS M50. And my experience of this camera so far has been fantastic. I've thoroughly enjoyed using it. I don't think I'm gonna be upgrading anytime soon from this camera. I think it's the best on the market for vloggers just now that aren't willing to spend a lot of money on their gear. Cause um, I, I'm not willing to spend 2000 pound on a camera that I'm just gonna use for vlogging. For the 600 pounds, say 50 quid for a road mic, 60 quid for tripods, you got yourself a pretty decent setup, to be honest, that's pretty good. So for under a thousand pound, you're getting a fantastic setup and I can't recommend it high enough. Right, I'm gonna go make myself another coffee. I'm gonna go do some slow-mo footage and um, until next week, I'll see you soon, bye.